Welcome to our very first episode of PRISM, a design podcast that illuminates issues affecting the design community and beyond. Joining me now is Paul Hatch. Until recently, Paul was CEO of Teams Design in Chicago. He is currently pursuing a PhD in Cognitive Psychology and Learning Sciences. Paul co-founded Design House, a nonprofit with a mission to help revitalize local manufacturing. He is also the co-author of two books about the impact of design on business. Today's topic is how the industrial design industry has been influenced by the global pandemic and how this field will continue to evolve as a result. Hello, Paul. How are you? Really great to see you. You too, Dan. How are you? Uh, Great. Uh, Except, yes, we are living in a very strange time. I think we would both admit uh, the world is certainly changing. Um, And we are dealing with something truly extraordinary in our field of design. You know, when I think about especially how we create, how creatives create, we, we often need togetherness. And yet now we are being forced to be apart. How are you guys dealing with that at Teams Design and even for yourself? How do, how do you, how are you dealing with this? It, it is interesting in the world of design when we've always worked very closely together, collaboratively, you know, with clients or among designers. And I think some of the best work happens that way. And I've always, um, I've never really pictured that working from home would work when you're working creatively with a team of people. Uh, But if anything, I've been very surprised at how doable it actually is. It is not the best situation, right? We're so used to working in an open studio. We've got our own methods, got everything on the walls, and we're able to bounce ideas around and pull other people into things straight away. So we are definitely missing some of our tools, but I think we've got a new set of tools that we're able to use as well. I have always felt that design is this sort of uh, very tightly linked like apparatus that joins psychology, craft, problem solving, technology, art, science, engineering, and it's it's an intricate blend. But I think the most important one obviously is psychology, you know, because what we're doing is we are creating percepts. We're trying to create a perception by creating some kind of stimulus, whether it is a uh, an initial, very satisfactory distal stimulus, when you touch something, there's uh, a feeling that you get, it begins to form a perception. And good design always does that. And it come, all of our senses feed into our perception. Did the pandemic amplify your feelings about psychological curiosity, especially related to design and usability and the various human factor? Yeah, the the timing of my move kind of says that, but it was actually a decision um, and a commitment I made before the pandemic came about uh, sometime last year. And and, uh, over the last uh, year or so, started my transition at at Teams. Um, uh, But the the, the real crux of the question, you know, why go down that path? I want to go down that path to uh, find out what's there and bring it back. You know, I, I, I want these two, these two things to become inter- intertwined, design and psychology. I've been surprised at how separate they, they are. And, um, and it's chiefly because of the roots of psychology came out of um, a, a very um, sciencey science world and have, have always... Um, fought to keep their scientific relevance very clear. And, uh, you know, messing with artists and, and creativity just makes things less sciencey. But now is the time. Now is the time to get the two things intertwined. And like you said, there's so much we, we need to know as designers regarding the psychology, particularly cognitive psychology or, or uh, visual perception, for instance, or all sorts of perception. Um, and so um, many years ago, 15 years ago, I started to get interested in uh, that question. How can we as designers design for people and expect them to see in, in what we've designed what we see? If we don't know how humans perceive things, how, how people use their emotions to, uh, to perceive objects, how can we design 
objects for them and expect our messaging to come across. And so that question is the thing that led me to to read a lot of books, to investigate a lot. And I found there were, there, was, there were not many answers there when it comes to three-dimensional objects. We know a lot about psychology and cognitive psychology and visual perception when it comes to 2D objects, like on the screen and on paper and artwork. But very little has been studied when it comes to our relationship with objects. So that's something that uh, I've now decided to, to dive into with both feet and uh, to see what what we can bring, what we can actually get by bringing the two communities together. So I think one of your tasks is going to be, or your challenge is going to be to like, not to prescribe formula, but to offer understanding, mm -hmm. which ultimately I think would be best used in encouraging more empathy, um, more exacting kind of precise solutions for end users where the ownership experience is very long lasting, very enriching, very enabling and very supportive because there was an initial perhaps greater understanding of what you're trying to achieve as far as like breaking through mm -hmm. to the end user. Yeah, and designers are excellent about tapping into that zeitgeist, right? So you're always thinking about, well, we live with one foot in the future, right? Two, three years ahead of us. We kind of know the, the, the systems that come together. We look for convergences and, and divergences to, to kind of predict that, that pin. Because like you say, what we design today isn't going to be in people's hands for a while. And, and you want it to be relevant for another decade. Have you seen a different type of work coming into the office because of the pandemic? I see the change, you know, at Teams, just using that as the as the example, as as being more our relationship with our clients. Uh, I think it's going to come out a lot stronger and healthier coming out of it. Uh, but there's going to be other processes. Uh, Pre-pandemic, we were involved in uh, doing a lot of workshops, um, a lot of face-to-face, -face, lots of people flying from over the country. We got big, huge studios that enjoy spending a few days in there doing the workshops. And it's brainstorm, tear down, radiation, depending where we're at. Mm -hmm. I think some of that is going to be replaced with other methods. Of course, it's going to vary. Um, and I think the... Um, Yes, I do believe the product type uh, is going to change somewhat. But I think the types of products that we were working on are things that are not necessarily so hit by the uh, pandemic as such. You know, it's not something I expect to be changed. People will uh, still need power tools, still need medical instruments um, now, and they will after the pandemic. Yeah, interesting. No, I, I would agree with that as far as process goes. That's that's changing very rapidly. I am seeing in our firm a little bit of a shift toward more life science related work. For example, we're we're working on like three different complex DNA testing equipment. And we're also seeing some moves in process design. Um, mm -hmm. Thinking about like fulfillment of all different kinds of things. You think about like Amazon, that's a fulfillment service, like boxes come in your door. But how does food come to your door? How do other things come to your door? How can you consume things and receive them, get them fulfilled, your needs fulfilled? So we're doing more service design in ways that um, was kind of a surprise. It's more like actions are being designed in addition to objects. And that's like a fascinating new realm for us. Yeah. And there's, there's a strong emphasis on anything that's going to allow you to have a great life or higher quality of life while at home. One thing I was wondering about is there was a recent um, article in Fast Company talking about uh, how can independent design consultancies survive after all this turmoil, you know, through the pandemic and, of course, before. Um, you know, I've got my own thoughts, but I was wondering about yourself because your, your company is thriving right now. You're, you're not um, 
going on the predicted path of, oh, no, the pandemic's shutting us down, you know. You, no. You've got a lot going on. So what do you think generally of independent agencies that haven't been bought out now? Um, is this a time where we can all thrive or really does it depend on how we handle it? Whether you're independent or dependent, we are all suffering from the same thing. So we will all be affected by the same thing that affects everyone else, right? The economy does not single out independent or larger corporations necessarily. I think you just have to be, you have to be quick. Um, you have to be more of uh, more in your uh, guerrilla marketing suit all the time. Um, you can never drop the ball. Um, and it's easy to do when you're working from home and you can't collaborate the way that you normally would. Um, I actually find it a little bit sad to see a lot of really good independent firms sell out. Um, I believe you can be strong in a vision when you are independent. You can at least build your own brand the way that you want to build it. You can keep it fresh. You can change faster. You, you don't have to answer to the man, so to speak, and you can be a little irreverent because you're, you're in control of your own future this way. Like when I read that Fast Company article, I was like, what? This doesn't make any sense. Why, why would independent firms suffer more than the larger firms? Maybe the larger firms able to throw more money at a sustained downturn and keep payroll up a little bit easier, pay rent a little bit easier. But you know, I'm seeing these big companies having to shut down massive facilities. And I've seen companies, much bigger companies go under. And I just, I just don't see the link between the pandemic and whether you're owned by a bigger company or, or you're independent. Mm -hmm. You just have yeah. to stay strong, keep doing your thing, very, very focused. I think that's our trick. We know we're good at, like, this is an area we're good at. We are going to focus. We're going to deliver. We will never let a client down. And and yet, at the same time, while you have these a certain focus in in the key areas where you're you're good at, also branch out, realizing as we talked about a few minutes ago that that change is abreast. So we must respond to a changing market, changing needs with consumers, with enterprises, et cetera, and to be able to adjust our offering to the new, the new environment. There seems to be, um, you know, with some companies, a lot of stasis right now because of the uncertainty. So people pump the brakes. And really what you said is, is actually what needs to happen. We need to innovate our way out of this. That doesn't mean fix the pandemic, but it means that, okay, the ideas you do now lead to products that are post-pandemic, right? So what is that new world? Um, you're right. I think, I think um, there should be a hive of activity right now uh, uh, among those uh, producing corporations that, that uh, want to now make the most out of the new world, right? The one that we're venturing into. Um, what, what do you think that new, I was just curious, because you've mentioned some of the changes and shifts you, you've had in, in certain categories. But if we fast forward a year or two, how do you think our new consumer looks like? You know, what is, what is that brave new world? What, what are the things they're going to look for there post-pandemic that they didn't look for before? Uh, good question. Um, they still have to meet certain needs, right? We've got hierarchy of needs to be thought about as designers too. In other words, consumers want to know how to safely go about staying fit, um, staying healthy, eating well. Um, how will we travel in the future? What does entertainment look like in the near future? Um, I think the way that we're consuming television and all types of data, including Zoom like this, I think this is all going to change. Um, while at the same time, I think because of what's happening, not only with the pandemic, but with, with politics and social change and greater awareness in general, albeit it doesn't feel good right now, 
2020 sucks, let's face it. It's, it's kind of a wake up call. And when you have a wake up call, it forces you to think again about these things that really matter to you. So I'm hoping that consumers and businesses start looking forward to the good old Q word, quality, that designers have always had on their flag. It's right up there as far as a priority. And that means what quality means is, you know, there's a delivered performance that you can always count on and expect. It ultimately does solve your problem. I'm talking about whatever the design solution is. And it's sustainable. It's smart. So whether people have been busy working or, or less busy working, we've all been at home more than we are. And we've been faced with our, our previous uh, consumerism uh, woes. And so I do believe if I follow those breadcrumbs, I do believe people will buy smarter, which is what we've always wanted instead of the throwaway consumerism, because we've been facing all that stuff over the last six months and well for the next, you know, nine months, six months or however long. So, um, so then follow those breadcrumb trails. I do believe there's going to be, um, not just a want for better products that I really need. Uh, but also could be sustainable. Uh, they could uh, keep the products longer, which also makes them sustainable uh, if it's more valuable to me and it makes more sense. Uh, we are spending more time at home. We've become more aware of our lives here. Yes. So I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic about the new world. Yeah, I, good. I, I think I am. <laughs> I'm, and yet, you know, when you see the world kind of on a day-to-day -day basis, kind of coming apart the seams. And if you, you know, see what's happening to our planet, it's very, very sad. Um, you know, what I read yesterday, 50% of the Australian coral reef is gone, has disappeared in the last eight years. 50%. It's crazy. Yes. Some of these problems seem so intractable for an individual. So we really need to rewrite the very constructs that we we all are driven by. I believe the pandemic, if anything, again, looking at it optimistically, is a reset button. And it will be defined by those companies that decide, let's innovate. Let's, let's take this chance because nobody knows what's happening. But a large corporation has the chance to define what the future is, right? They don't have to suddenly follow everyone else. That's right. And I think it's it's natural for humans to to be pendulums. Uh, when something really bad happens, you want to reverse that and make something really good happen. So a lot of this negativity that we're seeing now, I think will swing back into a positivity. It's a natural way of the universe as well. Um, things seek an equilibrium. Yeah, and I, I think you're right. We should look at the problems as a motivator, right? Um, Designers, uh, the design world is generally operated best when things are uncertain. So when the last recession happened, uh, a lot of business was businesses uh, were caught short and they didn't know what to do, don't know what to do. And somehow a lot of design thinking seemed to come into businesses then. They saw the value of it because with that, you can tackle those those. those uh, blank sheets of paper, right? That's the plan. You start off with a blank sheet of paper after a reset, after the, the recession. Uh, people didn't know which way it was up. Now, all that sounds like nothing now that we're in the pandemic. But at least back then, it seemed like the world was collapsing. It's all relative. Um, but I saw back then that designers were, were um, actually on the right side of the, the, the mental attitude towards dealing with issues. When the world turns upside down, we're like, oh yeah, I can work with that. And I think that, yeah, I think the word essence for me maybe kind of floats to the surface because the pandemic is really bringing forward this notion, like just give me the essence of a solution I want. I want something that works better, that alleviates whatever my pain point or concern is at the moment. Um, and that translates into a lot of things. Give me the essence of how I'm going to stay healthy when I can't go to the gym anymore. Um, give me 
a healthcare solution where I can actually talk to my doctor remotely and give me the essence of my my health solution. Mm. Uh, and and let's stop being so uh, maybe distracted by all of the contravances, the things in our world that quite frankly don't really mean that much. It's a contravance. And when you start thinking that way, essence means everything to you. And ultimately that's what I think life is about. I completely understand why you're doing what you're doing. I think it's, I laud you for doing this because there's a, a world of understanding there. And I think having come out of decades of being a design consultant as you have to be able to take that knowledge and understand it maybe more and frame it within this, this world of psychology. What a great, what a great experience that's going to be for you. Well, we'll see, we'll see where it takes us. I feel like I've been uh, working downstream a lot, enjoying the river and I'm heading up the mountain to find the source and I have no idea what's up there. Oh, great. Um, take lots of gear and food with you because we want that to be very high. <laughs> um, Paul, I cannot thank you enough. I really enjoyed this conversation. And best of luck on this on this new venture of yours. And uh, we right. shall conclude, my friend. Yes, thank you. And it's great, exciting hearing about what your company is taking on now as well and uh, the changes and you're certainly weathering the storm. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Dan. All right. Bye.